the thing I like best about the book is is the subject. The everything is in Genesis. And if I could only choose two books of the Bible to have in my possession, the first would be the Gospel of John, and the second would be Genesis. The third would be Romans. And almost everything is in Genesis. Um, Jesus is in Genesis. Scripture says in 2 Timothy 2, study to show yourself approved unto God a workman that needs not to be ashamed. Well, my guest today is one such man who has studied for many years to study himself approved, Ronnie Stevens. And uh, Ronnie Collier Stevens, welcome to Mid-South Viewpoint. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here. You and I hang out quite often in this room we're in right now. Whenever I can catch you, if you're not, you know, teaching somewhere or running around to see the grandkids in California, Pathway to Discipleship that airs on our station, and then a new feature we just started called Rampart. Yes, and um, I guess that's your cross to bear to have to hang out so much with me, but you you do get paid for this, so sometimes you have to earn your money. Yeah, yeah and it's all a, a great shock for me. I didn't anticipate um, even doing what we're doing right now. We have a great time together, and I, I, I enjoy getting to know you more, Ronnie. When you were here, here in Memphis pastoring at First of Ann, where I think you were about nine years, I believe, heard about you got to meet Ronnie Stevens, and our paths never crossed, <laughs> you know, for until years later. And we have a couple mutual friends, Pastor Al in Jerusalem and Jim Allman, uh, two gentlemen that you went to Dallas Seminary with. Yes, um, I actually knew Al. He was a year or two behind me in Dallas, and our church in North Carolina helped to support him when he first went overseas. I also knew him when he was a pastor in Vienna. And Jim Allman was, I'm sure, one of the two most brilliant students in my class at Dallas, but I never knew him. I was single in seminary. He was married. And sometimes the married students and the single students, our paths didn't necessarily cross that often. So I only got to know Jim when I moved to Memphis, and he was in our church, and he was a pastor. At, uh, he was a professor at Crichton. So you grew up in Georgia, which that state right now is getting a lot of attention as we record yes. our show. Yes. Um, I was born in Atlanta. My parents actually met at the Varsity in 1947, which is a great Atlanta landmark. It was the largest drive-in restaurant in the world. <laughs> I've been there. <laughs> Have you really? Yeah. <laughs> and I grew up in a suburb of Atlanta, north, a northeast suburb on the I-85 corridor in the direction of Greenville, South Carolina, called Norcross, about 15 miles out. So my family were really more uh, influenced, more of a part of the country, which was behind us, than the city which was in front of us. So... I've always lived in big cities, or most of the time, especially recently, but um, there's, there was a country ethos in my family growing up. What was your mom and dad like? My mother was a nurse, um, very godly, and she was my first Christian influence, and she was like chairman of the uh, mission circle at our church, what in Southern Baptist churches was called the WMU, the w Women's Missionary Union. My father was a Baptist deacon. I would say that his commitment to the Lord was fairly casual. I didn't have great assurance that he that he knew Jesus personally until the last week of his life. He died at 67. His his forebears all lived to their 90s, but he was taken by cancer of the bone when he was three years younger than I am right now. But he, he, was, a, he was an entrepreneur. He was a businessman. He did really, really well in business. Uh, but he came back. He actually retired in his 40s. But he came back out of retirement to rescue his uh, former employees, and he trusted some people he shouldn't have trusted. So he, he actually was um, rather poor. Yeah. At the time he died. What are some traits from your dad that uh, you admire, some characteristics that uh, that were qualities that you really respected? Well, one thing was his great generosity. That's what stood out. And his generosity was so great that it probably disabled me in some areas. He probably should not have been as generous to me as he was. He was entrepreneurial. He could build. I didn't get this gene. My sister got it. My sister actually resurrected his business and continues in his business. Um, but uh, he could build anything. And every mechanical or practical principle is an impenetrable mystery to me. It's, it's funny. When, when I've pastored churches and 
wives had husbands who traveled, I would always say, now, if anything breaks down, give me a call, and I'll send Jane over to fix it. That's my <laughs> wife. And, and that, that's a joke, but it was, it was true. So he and I were very, very different. Ronnie, when and how did uh, the gospel become clear to you when you realized your need for Jesus Christ? Well, because I grew up in a family where my mother and father went to church every Sunday, and my mother went to church on Sunday evening and Wednesday evening and took me along, I can never remember a time when I did not believe in Jesus. And I walked an aisle at age eight. I was baptized then. I assumed that I was a believer and that I strayed from the faith as a teenager and that I came back to the Lord at age 20. Later, that narrative wasn't working for me. And it was actually when I was a pastor here in Memphis that I realized, no, you didn't come back to the Lord at age 20. You came to the Lord for the first time at age 20. And my memory became more acute in terms of who I really was during those teen years. I grew up in the 60s. I was born in 1950, so my teen years exactly uh, tracked the 60s. But it wasn't, you know, those dramatic sins that we associate the 60s so much. There were other sins. And I thought, how could a believer do that? But the thing, the thing that really clinched it for me was there was no restraint before sin, and there was no regret after sin. Of course, there was a assent to the, the elements of the gospel, who Jesus was, who he did, but there was no evidence of regeneration. My spirit wasn't quickened. And then amazingly, and, and, and I thank God for this, my mother died seven years ago this week, and when we were clearing out her condominium, my wife found a letter that I had written to my parents when I was a first quarter freshman at the University of Georgia telling mainly my dad why I couldn't go into the family business, that I, um, that I had to become a pastor. Now, you might think, oh, well, that showed that you, maybe you really were a Christian before 20. Quite the contrary. As a matter of fact, the letter was so painful that I've still not read all of it. Hmm. I found that I couldn't read it all because it, it gave me so much pain. Because it was all about me, 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 me. It was nothing about Jesus. And it was, it was overwhelmingly obvious that the person who wrote that letter did not know the Lord. Yeah. But, but I, I praise God for it because it confirmed my later understanding of my own history. I became a Christian with every gospel privilege growing up. I did not become a, a believer until I was 20 years old. And my life radically changed. Did you have vocational or other career aspirations other than ministry when you were at the University of Georgia? Well, I think I think um, the obvious thing for me to do would be to work in my father's business. But I, I realized even then that I had no real aptitude. And I, I didn't really realize it as much then as I do now. The other thing, I think I would have been a football coach. And I think that was— Did you play football? Uh, I did. I, I played in high school, and I walked on, um, which if people don't know what that means, I didn't have a scholarship. But I, I walked on at the University of Georgia, and they gave me a freshman letter through some inexplicable mix-up, probably because they were just <laughs> rewarding me for not actually expiring on the practice field. So I always practiced. I never played. I was not good enough to play. I was declared ineligible uh, in my sophomore year on a technicality. Um, but you wore a Georgia jersey. I, I, I did. I did. <laughs> Nobody knew who was that number. Uh, and, of course, it was mainly freshman stuff. I did do um, spring practice and two-a-days with the varsity my sophomore year. and then. Uh, but I, I, there was an honorable way out. I, I, I got my tuition paid because I was blind in one of my eyes. And in those days, that was not compatible with uh, competing at the varsity level. So it was an honorable way out. I would have had to give up that money, even maybe give back what I got as a freshman, although no one would have paid attention to me. When did the call to ministry, when, when was that solidified for you? Well, as soon as I became a Christian, um, I wanted to be a missionary. But I knew that my gifts were probably more suited to being a pastor than a missionary. I'm a very poor linguist. And plus, I was addicted to America, especially the American South, especially Atlanta. 
And um, so I just took the path of least resistance. And as soon as I finished at Georgia, I went to seminary. And uh, as soon as I finished seminary, I became a pastor in Virginia on the edge of the Blue Ridge Mountains, an incredibly beautiful place. But um, later, God made it clear that I was to go overseas, and it was absolutely fabulous. Okay, when you made that decision, was Jane part of the picture at that time? Well, she was my wife, (laughs) so she was part of the picture. (laughs) I would say that the true missionary sacrifice in our family has been made by Jane, because Jane would have been quite happy to live all our married life in the United States. I, like most men, just do what I would like to do and try somehow to justify it by saying it's God's will. And I would say that her her missionary calling was her calling to me. But in, in terms of the last time we went overseas, God greatly honored her willingness to make that sacrifice and gave her a tremendous ministry when we were in uh, Budapest. Prior to going to Budapest, and we'll back up a little bit, uh, you after pastoring there, uh, as you mentioned, in Virginia, you also pastored in North Carolina. But then there was this process uh, where you moved to Germany in 86. Well, I'm really drawn to need, and I'm really drawn to situations where people can't access the truth. And there's tremendous need in this country. I mean, there are hundreds of thousands of people who don't know Jesus within a 20-mile radius of where you and I are sitting. But it's not because the gospel is inaccessible. It's not because they don't know about this radio station. It do, it's not because they don't know where a church is. It's just because they're not interested. I was drawn to places where people didn't know what the gospel was. They didn't know where they could find out about the gospel. And therefore, uh, Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union, the Soviet satellite countries, w- was, r- was deep in my heart. So... I had a wonderful, wonderful experience in a church on the North Carolina coast, and we were there um, about eight years, and a situation came up where um, I I had to oppose a very powerful person in the church, and I knew that, and he and I had a wonderful relationship, but it was me adjudicating his relationship with other people, you know, in a way that he didn't really like. And I realized there was going to be warfare in the church if I stayed. And I I wrote a letter to a missionary friend in Vienna whom we supported, also a Dallas Seminary classmate. And I said, "Um, I know I'm going to have to leave here, but I don't know where to go. Pray that the Lord would show me where to go. And the same week, he got a letter from friends in Munich who said, we're going to plant an English-speaking church here in Munich, but we don't know who should be our pastor pray that we'll know who should be our pastor. So he connected us, and very quickly they called me. And so it meant that I could be a pastor. And I, and I, I said, I'm not going to move my family to Europe to minister to expats, to minister to English speakers, and, but if you will let me work in Eastern Europe, I'll come. And they said, well, well you can work in Eastern Europe anytime you want because we're not going to give you any money. <laughs> so you're going to have to raise your own support. So I thought, well, this is great because I can be a pastor and I can work in Eastern Europe anytime I want to. And it was absol- it was fabulous. While there in Munich, uh, pastoring this church in Germany, uh, you did have an opportunity to reach Eastern Europe covertly in the Soviet Union, Romania, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, and Poland. These were some additional opportunities that God gave you. And this was done covertly. Well... It was done covertly after a fashion, and here's what I mean by that. You have to realize that the Soviets and their allies, they stole nuclear secrets from us at the highest level of our government. Well, Ronnie Stevens wasn't going to slip in there and them not know what I was doing. So they, I wasn't important enough. I wasn't a big enough fish for them to, to give me much trouble. And in those days, you know, after Stalin, I wasn't really in danger of being executed or or even imprisoned. There could be a degree of danger for those whom we met with. So the true coercion was getting to the meetings. And, of course, I went in as a tourist, 
and um, and I, I started out in Hungary, and uh, most of the time, most of my visits were actually in Romania, and but I was I did visit those other countries. I got into the Soviet Union at only you know a year or so before the Soviet Union imploded, but. Um, I had the great fortune that Campus Crusades, Eastern European and Soviet headquarters in those days, was in Munich. So people who worked in those areas a lot were in my church. And my friend in Vienna, he worked in another really important covert ministry uh, called BEE, Biblical Education by Extension, out of Vienna. So I, would, I was simply a subcontractor. For Campus Crusader BEE. They would do all the heavy lifting, they would make all the contacts, they would set up all the meetings, and I just had to show up and, and teach. And it was it was a thrilling, fabulous experience. After being settled there in uh, Munich, uh, as I mentioned, from 86 and 90, 1991, uh, after the dissolve of the Soviet Union, you, Jane, and the three children uh, moved to Moscow. Uh, where you became the first pastor of Moscow Bible Church. Did you teach in Russian? <laughs> oh, as I said, I'm a very poor linguist. As a matter of fact, when we moved to Budapest, I, I said, just think, Jane, this will be the third language we haven't learned. <laughs> I had, this is an exaggeration, but it feels true, I, I had almost a Russian Shakespeare who was my interpreter, and he's actually known all over Russia. As a matter of fact, you, uh, I know you broadcast J. Vernon McGee, who's long in heaven. Well, my friend, Oleg Shevkun, was, is the Russian language voice of J. Vernon McGee. And it's funny because Oleg speaks with a much better accent than I do. His accent is rather British. And as you know, uh, Dr. McGee has an Appalachian accent, yeah. and uh, it's quite a contrast. And um, But anyway, he made me much better. And someone much, once told me that the, the, the wrong translator can make Chuck Swindoll sound like Elmer Fudd. Yeah. But it also works the other way. I had a translator who made me much better, and uh, that church grew very quickly. It was thrilling, and... Um, we were only there for two years. The, the Soviet Union imploded in the in autumn of uh, 91, and we moved there in the summer of 92. My wife has a winter darkness syndrome, and Moscow winters were not a long-range possibility for her. Yeah, pretty brutal. Uh, well, and it wasn't the cold so much, yeah. but it was the darkness. It got dark so early, and she had three little children and was sort of housebound and it just um, it wasn't it wasn't viable. Yeah, my wife wouldn't have done very well with that either. She yeah. doesn't like the winter months. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I've interviewed a former Soviet minister of education on the show in the past, uh, who told me about the moral vacuum that was created at the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, I remember her telling me that the, there was high suicide rate and you know drug abuse and all the things that go along you know with that. People, I guess, trying to maybe find their identity in, in a, a new form of government, a new lifestyle. They weren't really sure, you know, have, didn't have the security or know what their place was. And so uh, she was given the task of uh, doing research and finding out what they could do to in, instill maybe uh, some, some morals or some help for students in public schools. So she studied for three years with her team, and she discovered that 70 years prior to the revolution, that uh, Russians were reading their Bibles. They were reading God's Word. And so she went back with her plan, and she wasn't even a follower of Christ, saying that, I think we need to institute the, the Bible into our public schools and teaching, which in the process of that, she became a believer in Christ. Speak to me, if you will, Ronnie, about that, that period, because you were on the cuff there of coming out of this oppression for so many years with these people in communism? Well, I think, obviously, she's the authority and she's the insider, but what she said resonates with what I found to be true there. All governments try to um, justifiably or unjustifiably 
foist a certain national identity on their citizens. And the Soviets uh, tried to teach the Russian people and the people from the, the non-Russian republics who they were. And what they taught them is that they were in the vanguard of the revolution rel- worldwide. And they were uh, building socialism, and they were building the new Soviet man or the new socialist man. Of course, that was always bogus. And the leaders who were trying to brainwash people with these new identities, they didn't really believe those things themselves. They were in it for the power and the freedom that being a a high-ranking party member would give them, the advantages that it would give them. They didn't really buy the ideology. There are very, very few. Most people know that Marxist economics doesn't work. The Chinese know that. Um, So when communism collapsed and they realized, well, that's all a sham, they had to ask the question, well, now who are we? And there was a moral vacuum because there was, there was a Marxist morality, uh, far inferior to biblical morality, but there, was, there were expectations of certain behaviors which would be uh, helpful in building socialism and spreading the revolution. And so, but now who are we? And, and of course, the morality is tied to the legality. If a person is not moral, it's very hard for them to keep all the laws, because so many of the laws are based on some idea of morality. So the the new Russia realized we have to address this moral vacuum. And some of the people who were just being true to the data they were discovering about their own history realized that, well, you know, the Bible is a good thing. It's It's going to help us. And, you know, the Bible does not teach people to resist the state or to try to overthrow the state. And the Bible encourage, encourages its adherents to keep the laws. And so uh, I'm not sure that many of the top leaders became Christians, but they saw the usefulness of inculcating biblical values. And so for many years, this, the, the new Russian government was very friendly to missionaries, and that I, I was a beneficiary of that. Ronnie, one of the reasons why we have come to the studio today for our show is to talk about a brand new book just off the press that you've written, uh, From Creation to Covenant, A Year in Genesis. It's a daily devotional, one year in the book of Genesis that you've written. And uh, I want to, as we finish out this show, I'm going to have to ask you if we can do a part two of our interview because I've got a lot more I want to talk to you about. But I don't want to leave the show today without mentioning this book and letting you talk. We're going to go more in detail about the book on our next program. But I do want to just touch on it, let people know that it's available. It's at your website. I believe you can go to the website, and I, I wrote my, in my notes here. Ram- Rampartpublications.com. Rampartpublications.com. The book is available. It's in- also available at Second Presbyterian Church in Memphis. In their bookstore. And Independent Presbyterian Church in Memphis. Okay, give me some words on this. Why did you write this book? Well, I'm... Sp- I'm semi-retired, and by that I mean I don't have a pastoral charge. I I am assisting in a a church in Mississippi. But um, you're used to preparing sermons. You're used to speaking two or three times a week, and all of a sudden that's gone. And I was living overseas, and I moved back to America. So the first thing I did is I, I began to teach with my pen or with my computer. And it's the simplest kind of book. It's just a commentary, a devotional commentary on the biblical text day by day. And so I, it took me two volumes to cover John, and even though there are 50 chapters in Genesis, we did the Genesis book in one chapter, and it just came out a few weeks ago. You did it in one book. Yes. You've got some, some friends who've uh, recommended this book, uh, Mark Booker, senior pastor at Park Street Church in Boston, it says, I heartily recommend Ronnie Stevens, Ronnie Collier Stevens' Reflections on Genesis. He's punchy and poetic. <laughs> you like well, that? Those are his words, <laughs> not mine. Actually, um, Park Street Church Boston is, well, it is the most prestigious church in New England, but I, I owe my relationship with Mark to the fact that he was an undergraduate at Rhodes College. 
And when he was a student at Rhodes, he went to First of Ann, and we used to meet regularly. I performed his wedding here in Memphis. It was the most, it was the greatest celebration in any wedding I've ever been in. Mm-hmm. And he went on from Rhodes to, uh, he was actually a nominee for a Rhodes scholarship from Rhodes. He didn't get it, but he, he got another scholarship, and he went on and got two other degrees at Oxford, became an Anglican, an Anglican uh, minister in Boston, and Park Street is not an Anglican church, but they called him about a year ago to be their senior minister. And so it's my Memphis and Rhodes connection. That's a great story. That's the way that happened. Great story. What do you like best about this book? Well, the thing I like best about the book is is the subject. Everything is in Genesis. And if I could only choose two books of the Bible to have in my possession, the first would be the Gospel of John, and the second would be Genesis. The third would be Romans. And almost everything is in Genesis. Um, Jesus is in Genesis throughout. Uh, the Genesis 22, which is where the sacrifice of Isaac, or the almost sacrifice of Isaac, takes place, which is the subject of the cover from Rembrandt's painting of the sacrifice of Isaac. I would call Genesis 22 the Mount Everest of the Old Testament. There's never any place higher in the Old Testament than Genesis 22. You never get closer to Calvary in the Old Testament than Genesis 22. From Creation to Covenant, A Year in Genesis by Ronnie Collier Stevens. Go to rampartpublications.com and get your copy. Ronnie, it's always a pleasure, my dear friend, to get together with you. We're going to hang around and do a second interview for a part two. How about that? That'll be great. (laughs) All right. Well, friends, that's all the time we have on this edition of Mid-South Viewpoint. Thanks for stopping by. I'm Byron Tyler, and we'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye.